in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which is the final chapter of the book. And we'll spend a few weeks in this last chapter and then be done with 1 Thessalonians. We're going to cover a pretty big chunk today, the first 11 verses of chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. And our Ventura campus will be joining us for the sermon today. Let's let them know that we love them so much. Give them some love. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll read verses 1 through 11, and then we'll talk about it. I'll be reading and teaching from the New American Standard Bible. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, excuse me, in chapter 5, verse 1. Now, as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anyone, anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them, suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that is before us, and we believe it to be just that, your word, God's very word, inerrant, authoritative, living and active, true and right in all that it teaches. Thank you for it, Lord. We ask together that you'd please help me to explain it, teach it in a way that's faithful and helpful, and that you would help us to hear it in a way that is faithful and obedient. Please, Lord, we ask for the help of the Holy Spirit that your word would have a profound effect in our lives and that we would endeavor by grace to bring our lives in line with the call of your word for the glory of Jesus because we are the beloved of God in Christ. We ask these things together. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, there are two sets of questions that every person, all people, ponder from time to time. The first relates to what happens after death. Where do our loved ones go? And will we see them again? The question of bereavement, and we saw that dealt with in the text last week. Second set of questions, excuse me, relates to the end of the world. Will there be a day of reckoning, of judgment, and if so, how do we prepare ourselves for it? The issue of judgment is dealt with in our text today. And these are the questions that were on the minds of the church in Thessalonica in the first century, of the Christians and of the broader culture. And these are similar sets of questions to what all of humanity today is asking. And so they, like many, were worried in this context about their Christian loved ones who had died. Would they miss out on the coming of the Lord for his people was what they were wondering last week. And we saw there God's glorious plan for those who die in Christ, that when Jesus returns, they will be risen in glory and receive their glorified bodies. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up, translated, meet the Lord and our loved ones, and thus we shall always be together. We saw that last week. And that's glorious news. It encourages us greatly. It helps us tremendously to know of God's plan and our future resurrection. 
Today in the text, another concern of theirs is addressed. They were worried not about Christian loved ones who had died. They were worried about themselves and whether they were ready to stand before Christ at his coming, whether or not they were ready for the judgment. And what they assumed about that is what many people in our culture assume today, even many within the church. They assume that if we could only know when the Lord would judge the earth, then we could certainly make ourselves ready for that time. Right? Makes sense. If we just know when, then we'll get ourselves together and we'll be ready for when it comes. That was their assumption. And Paul's point in the text is that the solution is not knowing, in, is not knowing when judgment will come, but the solution is knowing to whom judgment will come. It's not a question of when, it's a question of to whom. Now we know that judgment is in view here by that phrase in verse two, the day of the Lord. Look in verse two. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, there's a phrase, will come just like a thief in the night. In scripture, that phrase, the day of the Lord, is sort of a catch-all phrase for God's judgment come to earth, culminating in the return of Christ to establish his kingdom in righteousness. The day of the Lord is a catch-all biblical phrase for God's judgment come to earth, culminating or ending in Christ's return to earth to establish his kingdom. We get that phraseology, of course, from the Old Testament and from the prophets. Joel spoke of it with that phrase. He said, blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord, there's that phrase, is coming. Surely it is near. What is it? A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. We can see the character of what is denoted by that phrase. Isaiah spoke of it in these terms. Wail, for the day of the Lord, there's the phrase, is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. So now we have a sense of what the day of the Lord is. It's that thing that we were speaking of in our study of the book of Revelation from chapter 6 to 19. The day of the Lord. God's wrath poured out on an unrepentant world. And the scriptures say it's a day of darkness and gloom because it is destruction from the Almighty. It is, in no uncertain terms, unapologetically and yet difficultly, God's judgment come to earth on sin, wickedness, and rebellion. So if that's true, if that's going to happen, then of course everybody wants to know, well, when is it going to take place? And that's what these believers were wondering. When is it going to take place? And the short answer is, we don't know. And the other part of the answer is, it's the wrong question. That's why he starts out and says to them in verse 1, now as to the times and epochs, times in Greek is chronos, general times, epochs is kairos, particular, specific times. As to these things, timelines and situations about this, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to. In other words, there's nothing to write to you because it's not so much a when question. At least that's what Jesus said. Look what Jesus says in Mark chapter 13. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Talking about his return and of course the judgment that comes before that. Further, Jesus said in Matthew, therefore be on the alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. For this reason you must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think. So there's that idea of uncertainty as to the time. Coming like a thief in the night. Verse 3 makes us see that it's sudden and unexpected in nature. Look at verse 3 in our text. It says, while they are saying peace and safety or everything's cool, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pains upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. When everyone, the whole world is saying, look, everything is cool. We got it handled. We're good in our lives apart from God. Then, like a thief in the night, suddenly judgment comes to earth. 
And this peace and safety idea and a misunderstanding of the Lord's timing is getting at a little bit by Peter in his second epistle. He says, most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following after their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? Does that sound familiar? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. In other words, you Christians have been saying for 2,000 years, Jesus is coming again. And yet nothing changes. The world goes on and on and on. So what is all this talk about Jesus coming again? We're not buying it. That's what the Bible said people will be saying. Verse 5. They deliberately forget, interesting language, huh? They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. Now we're talking about the power and the authority and the faithfulness of God's word and promises. That he brought the earth out of the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. They forget that judgment has come to earth before. It's not unprecedented. It's not as though God has never done that. Remember the flood, Genesis. Verse seven. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. Fire is judgment language. Look at the next sentence. They're being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your namesake. Listen to this. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to repent. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Judgment is coming to earth, it's sure. Much of humanity is saying, no, it won't, but Scripture's addressing that there. Listen, God has judged the world before. God is going to judge the world ultimately. Well, well, when? It's been so long and so much has gone wrong. Where is God? Does he really keep his word? Is he really faithful? Is he really going to deal with it like you people say? Time is different on God's scale. A thousand years like a day, a day is like a thousand years. And by the way, he's not being slow because he's lagging in some way. He's being slow because he's incredibly merciful. He actually doesn't want anybody to be judged. He's righteous, so there has to be judgment, right? He's not a crooked judge. He's not just going to overlook sin and just wink at it. He's righteous, so there has to be judgment, but he doesn't want anybody to be judged. He wants everybody to repent of their sins and be saved through the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. That is the plan. That is the desire of God. And yet many people, we're told in the scriptures here, will be saying, ah, peace and safety. Everything is fine. No worry. That's never going to happen. And indeed, the scriptures confirm here that the key is not Knowing when, the key is knowing to whom judgment is going to come. And the question that's in the, on the mind of this church here that was asking this of Paul was, should they fear the judgment of the Lord as Christians? Good question. Maybe not. I don't know. I want us to see it clearly portrayed in the text as we look at, you ready for a couple big words? The juxtaposition of pronouns. Oh my gosh, what do those words mean? You know what they mean. The juxtaposition of pronouns. Let's look at it starting in verse three. It says, while they, there's, there's a pronoun, part of speech, you got that. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them, pronoun, suddenly like birth pains upon a woman with child, and they, pronoun, shall not escape. Now look at the change. But you, you is a pronoun. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Notice the juxtaposition. Notice the difference. There's a they, them over there, and there's a you, us, we, over here, this is very politically incorrect. 
There's an in and there's an out. And there's a clear distinguishing of what these two different groups can expect. And what the text says clearly is that the coming judgment is for those who are in darkness, is the phrase that is used there. And that the judgment is not for those who are in the light or sons and daughters of the day. That's what's being said here. So if we're going to understand this, we need to understand very clearly what the Bible is talking about when it uses the metaphors of darkness and light, night and day. What are these pictures of in Scripture? Well, let me tell you first what they're not talking about. They're not talking about sort of the modern, even ancient ideas of philosophical speculation. The idea of enlightenment. It's not talking about some sort of intellectual ascent to some set of truths that causes you to transcend in some way. It's not talking about some sort of looking within where we find light within. It's not talking about those things. Whenever the Bible is using the metaphor of dark, light, night, and day, it is always in salvific terms. It's always talking about salvation. The idea being that those in the dark or of the night are apart from the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And those who are in the light or of the day are those who have repented of their sins, turned to Jesus for forgiveness. This is always salvific language. Darkness in scripture is a metaphor for lostness apart from Jesus. We see even the ancient prophets talking about this. Look at this passage from Isaiah. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. Now, when we get to Matthew, don't change the slide. When we get to Matthew later on, this is spoken of in the past tense of Jesus coming for the first time, right? To whom Jesus has come. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So in Matthew chapter four, it says, the people who walk in, that's not the scripture, take it away, please. It says the people, who, that's okay. We'll bring it back up. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light has shone upon them. Speaking of the coming of Jesus Christ for his work of salvation. This is in out salvation language. Apart from Jesus, with Jesus. Rejected Jesus, have turned in faith to Jesus. So Jesus puts it this way for us, John chapter 8. Then Jesus spoke again to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of the life. There it is. What is the path from darkness to light? Turning to Jesus, following Jesus, repenting of our sins and putting our faith in Jesus. To continue the metaphor, look how Paul talks about it in the book of Colossians chapter 1. Paul's praying for them saying, I've been giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. There's that language again. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see how the Bible uses this dark light metaphor? Apart from Jesus Christ, we are in darkness. When we come to Jesus Christ, because he is light, we are now in the light in him. He rescues us from the domain of darkness and we become saints in light. When we get saved, when we repent of our sins and put our faith in Jesus, we have an address change that happens. From the domain, the realm, the power of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved son, Jesus Christ, the king who is light and love and truth. There's an address change that happens. So it's not talking about some intellectual ascent to a set of ideas. It's not talking about some inward looking thing that brings enlightenment. It's not talking about some philosophical speculation. It's talking about Jesus Christ and what we do with him. Light and dark. Look at the way Jesus gave to Paul in Acts 26 when he called them to his ministry. He says, I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness 
to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. There's that juxtaposition. And that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. There's a substance of it. And an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, Jesus speaking. So to be in the light is to be in Christ through the repentance of sins, putting our faith in him. To be in the darkness is not to be in Christ. And it's not just to be ignorant of Christ. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about outright rejection of Christ. Now we read verses four and five again and we see this. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not night nor of darkness. So to answer the simple question of the church in Thessalonica, they asked last week, what do we do about Christians who have died? It was answered in the previous text. Now, how do we get ourselves ready for the judgment? When is it going to take place? He's saying to them, it's not an issue of when. It's an issue of to whom judgment will come. It will come to those who have rejected Jesus Christ and so are characterized as being in darkness of the night. But you, let me speak to the Christians, but you are of the day. So the day is not going to overtake you like a thief from the night. You don't have to worry about Christ's judgment on the earth because you have been forgiven of your sins. Christ took your judgment in your place on the cross that you might be forgiven once and for all. So that's not a worry or a concern for you. Someone say hallelujah. The question then is for every one of us, for every person in the world, where are you? I would be naive to think that everyone in this room is a Christian. Jesus made it clear that many people who sort of just outwardly call themselves Christians have never truly inwardly put their faith in Jesus Christ and been saved, born again, transformed, new nature. And then there are many people who are not Christians that come into the church looking for something. They're here among us today. And I'll tell you what you're looking for is Jesus. The only one who can bring you into the love of God through the forgiveness of sins, restore you to the relationship for which you were made. You were fearfully and wonderfully made by God. But our sins have made a separation between us and God. But because he loves us, he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross in our place that we might be forgiven of our sins and so restored to relationship and experience the love of God and the promise and reality of eternal life. And everything that you've been looking for is somehow connected to the darkness that you're in and the light to which you are invited. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Some of you have already made that decision. You're already Christians. You've been born again. You have a new nature. You've put your faith in Jesus Christ. I would say to you, rest and be secure in that then. Their folly was a little lack of theological understanding. They probably should have known that as Christians, we don't have to worry about God's wrath. Look at verse 9. For God has not destined us Right? There's that right set of pronouns. It's not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, asleep there being used as a euphemism for dead as a Christian, we may live together with him. So if you're a Christian, you don't worry about judgment for sins because Christ died in your place and he has taken all of our sins once and for all. So we rejoice in verses like 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And verse 9 here, we are not destined for wrath, but salvation because we put our faith in Jesus Christ. This is good news for the Christian who on occasion blows it really badly. Anybody here like that? <laughs> Any two-handed blow it people? <laughs> Gosh, if I had a third... And so we can't fault them, the church in Thess Thessalonica, too much. They were probably very much like us and at times struggled to get their lives together and obey the truth of Jesus Christ. And they're saying, well, if we, if we knew when the judgment was coming, then we 
clean it up and be ready for it. That's what everybody thinks. Wrong thought process. The only way to escape judgment is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ who is judging your place upon the cross. And so Christian, rest in it. Rest in it. Thank you, God. I am forgiven once and for all. Judgment is coming because God is righteous, but I, I don't need to worry about that. I now have a position before God as a beloved daughter, a beloved son. So rest in it and rejoice about it. I mean, somebody get happy. <laughs> Think about the depth of our sins. I'm a three-handed blowing it guy. Somebody rejoice about the fact that we have been forgiven. Though our sins were as scarlet, we've been washed white as snow. Our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. Buried in the deepest sea, God chooses to remember them no more. We are righteous in Christ. That is something worth... Go ahead. That's something worth getting happy about rejoicing about on a daily basis. Rest in it. Rejoice over it. And my goodness, worship because of it. I mean, listen, when you come to church and the music is playing and the words of praise are on the screen, what are you doing? There's only one thing you should be doing. In overwhelming gratitude, pouring out praise at the feet of Jesus because he saved a sinner like you, like me. Can we please stop with the hands in the pocket and the quiet little voices and the thinking about other people and what am I gonna have for lunch and does my outfit look good and why does it sound that way? Can we get over that and give Jesus the thanks and praise that he is due? I mean, if we've been saved, we ought, to, we ought to rest in that finished work of Jesus. We ought to rejoice in it. We ought to worship because of it. And, and, and the text is about to tell us. And we ought to obey because of it. Ooh. <laughs> Britt, that was such a fun part of the sermon until you said that. It was so happy, clappy, and yeah, I'll sing songs. And, The text is going to tell us that because we've been delivered from the domain of darkness, because we are not of the night and because we're not of the darkness, because we are of the light and of the day as followers of Jesus Christ, then we should live in a certain way and our lives ought to be as different from the rest of the world as day from night. So the text is going to say, verse six. Verse six says, so then. Do you, do you, stop right there. You know what so then means? Oh, it's a complicated Greek phrase. It means, so then, <laughs> in light of, because of, since the previous statement was just made that we are sons and daughters of the day, that we are in the light, so then. In other words, the right response then. The responsibility, the call of the text is, so then, let us not sleep. Let us not sleep. Now, what is meant by sleeping here? This is talking about a spiritual quality or lack thereof in the Christian's life. Paul is famous for mixing metaphors. In a few verses earlier, at the end of chapter four, he was using sleep as a euphemism for Christians who have died. We talked about that last week. Now he's using it in an entirely different way. Then again, in verse 10, he'll use it to talk about Christians who have died. But right now, he's talking about Christians who are asleep at the wheel. Not spiritually vibrant. No vitality to our relationship and our pursuit with Jesus. He says, listen, if we've been brought out of the darkness and into the light, verse six, so then let us not sleep as others do. Little jab there from Paul. They all knew who he was talking about. You know, others are sleeping. You know who we're talking about. You didn't get that joke. Okay, move on. <laughs> but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, 
having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So there's obviously an analogy going on here. There's this contrast between dark and light. And now Paul begins to say that it's not merely a state or a position. It is also a corresponding behavior. We all know those who are of the night and in the darkness behave correspondingly. And he uses this little analogy. Those who sleep, sleep at night. That makes sense. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Now, I know some people get drunk during the day, but it's just an analogy. Okay, it breaks down at some point. He's just trying to bring out the picture here that it's not only a state of being in darkness or in light, it is a way of being. Walking in darkness or walking in the light, there is a corresponding behavior that is expected for those who are of the day. Christians brought into the light through faith and repentance as it pertains to Jesus Christ. Jesus said it this way. We'll return to John chapter 8. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. That is both a promise and a call. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. We've been delivered from the domain of darkness. We have a new nature within us. The power of sin has been broken concerning us. We have eternal life in Christ and the Holy Spirit living in us. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. So we don't walk in darkness. We have newness of life, abundant life. It's a promise, but it is also a call. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. You darn well know that a lot of Christians can walk in a lot of darkness. Jesus is kind of drawing a line in the sand. Listen, this is tough stuff, but I've been dealing with it all week. You're just going to get it for 52 minutes. <laughs> he draws a line in the sand. Those who follow me will not walk in darkness. It's a promise and it's a call to walk in the light. Now, the word sober that's used in this text here is not here referring to the use of alcohol or substances, though certainly the Bible teaches that drunkenness is a sin. No question about it. But that's not the way that it's being used here. It's somewhat confusing because he mentioned drunkenness, but the, the translation is self-controlled. Most other translations will give you that. Self-controlled. The idea is a quality of Christian life that is not subject to every whim of sin that comes against us. The idea is that of Christian life in the Spirit, walking in the power of the Spirit, endeavoring to obey Jesus, experiencing the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Good job, church. First service didn't even get it at all. You guys got it. <laughs> it's referring to a quality of Christian life that is faithful, fruitful, watchful and active. That's the way that the phrase is used repeatedly in the New Testament beyond just the idea of drunkenness. Look here. But you, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Right? That's not talking about intoxication. That's talking about quality of Christian life that is alert, aware, not asleep at the wheel. Next verse. Therefore, Peter speaking, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. It's that quality of life. Chapter 5, verse 8 says, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's the way the New Testament is using this. this. This quality of Christian life that is alive and vibrant, pursuing Jesus. Skewing sin, pursuing Jesus. Romans puts it in great terms. Do this knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, right? 
There's that picture again. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed the return of the Lord. The night is almost gone. Talking about the spirit of the age, rebellion against Christ. The night is almost gone. The day is near. Speaking of the dawning of his return. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. You see that? Since these things are true, then we ought to live in this way. Verse 13. Let us behave properly. As in the day, there's that metaphor again. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Because we have been delivered from the domain of darkness. And though we have this flesh that rears its head and would endeavor in conjunction with the devil to lead us off into sin, we stand firm and resist because we're in the day. If you're children of the day, sons and daughters of the day, of the king, of the light, then don't live as though you belong to the night is what is being said here. Press into Jesus. The rationale for this is found in that analogy. Nighttime is for sleeping and drunkenness. Daytime is for right living. Again, verse five, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night or darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who do their sleeping do so at night and those who get drunk do so at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Are we as Christians going to be judged for our sins? When is it going to happen? We'll get it together and be ready. No, man, you're misunderstanding. The judgment is for those who are in the darkness, but, but, but you're in the light. So be secure. Rest. Rejoice. Worship. But also, obey. Because if you're of the day and you're in the light, then your life ought to be as different as day is from night. That's a Christian call. I would love to water it down for you. No, I want it. I would love to somehow soften. No, I want it. That's the call of Christ on his church. By the power of the Holy Spirit, because of grace, through the transforming work of God present in our lives, as a process with ups and downs and hurdles and challenges and failures and one step forward and three step back. But by the power of God, we are to be a transformed people. I like the way Paul puts it in Ephesians. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes upon those, pay attention to the pronoun, who are disobedient. Therefore, do not become partakers with them, pronoun. For you, change now. For you were once in darkness. No, it doesn't say in darkness. It says, for you once were darkness. (gasps) That's dark language. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. You see, this is an identity issue. This is an identity issue. What what forms our identity? The domain of darkness or the kingdom of the beloved son? This is an identity issue. We are children of God in Christ. And so we live out of that identity. This is a new nature transformation issue. For the fruit, verse 9, of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. I like that little parenthetical phrase. There's a good life plan. Find out what pleases the Lord. Oh Lord, what should I do? I don't know. If all else fails, find out what pleases the Lord and do that. Good advice. Next slide. 
have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. There's some political incorrectness for you. It's not that we just give into a wrong understanding of the pronouns and say, well, them, there, over there, do that, but we don't do that and we'll just be quiet about it, but rather expose them. Christians are called to be salt and light in the world. There is truth and error. There is right and wrong. There is dark and light. It's not that complicated. We stand upon God's word, and when there's error, we expose it. When there's corruption, wickedness, evil, we cannot be a silent church who says nothing in the face of it. Verse 12, it's shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything is exposed by the light. Everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. You, you ever been uh, at a party all night long and you wake up in the morning, you walk into the living room and it looks really different in the light? <laughs> is I the only one that has a past? At night, it was like, this is awesome, and this place is raging, oh, wow. And you walk out in the morning, you say, my mom's going to kill me. <laughs> Things look different in the light. Do you ever notice how when you go into the seediest of bars, they're always really well lit? <laughs> they're not, are they? And nobody wants to turn the lights on. This is why it is said, verse 14, wake up, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine upon you. There's that turning to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, away from darkness to the light. Be very careful then, so then, be very careful how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil, the ethos of the time. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Man, that's clear encouragement from the word of God. And verse 11 of our text tells us that's what we're to do with this. Verse 11, finishing, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. I like the way that the author of Hebrews put it. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good deeds. Isn't that cool? Let us think of ways to move each other toward faithful, fruitful Christian living. Let, let's endeavor to do that. How can I help you? How can you help me? How can we help each other? Let's, let's think of ways Another translation says, let us spur one another on toward love and good deeds. You, you, know, you know what spurring is, don't you? You know what that looks like? A little kick to the ribs with something sharp on occasion? This is Christian Community 101. <laughs> and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So the text is telling us, that we are free in Christ from the coming judgment. That we have the hope of salvation, it says there in verse 8, which is like a helmet upon our heads. It protects us from false thoughts. The fact that Jesus is coming again to ultimately deliver us. That we'll be in glory with him forever. Protects us from the lies of the enemy and self-accusation and the slander of others. This helmet of the hope of salvation. And then we have love and faith like a breastplate, it says in verse eight. The love of God, faith in Jesus Christ that covers us, so to speak, against the schemes of the enemy, the fiery darts of the evil one. Covers the vitals by faith in Jesus Christ and because of the love of God, we cannot be taken out by the enemy. I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God, Paul would say in Rome. And then the text tells us to be spiritually awake and self-controlled. Spiritually awake, vibrantly pursuing Jesus and self-controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit, not giving in to every whim and desire of sin in our flesh. 
Yesterday, my wife and Fifi and I and uh, some friends here from the church went to a farm out near Ojai from some people from our Ventura campus, the Paint a Pony Farm, which you can visit. It's wonderful. Lots of animals. I suggest you go there. They have 8,000 visitors a year. The Paint a Pony Farm. We went there and we got two piglets. Aww. We named them Bacon and Sausage. <laughs> that perhaps gives you a hint of why we got the pigs. <laughs> no, yes, I eat meat. <laughs> yes, I know. So we got these pigs. We're not going to eat them when they're little, sweetheart. There's this girl back there. She's like, <laughs> we would never eat, yes, you. We would never eat little piggies. We'll wait until they get fat and disgusting. And then we'll eat them. But yesterday, we got these pigs and we set up this corral at my house and they're in there and I could not stop watching these things. They're so cute. It's going to be hard to eat bacon and sausage. <laughs> They'll change like teenagers and old people, but for now, they're so cute. And we just watched them all day long. In fact, last night as the sun was setting, my wife and I set a bench up outside their little pen and we sat on it and we we're just watching the pigs for like an hour, put my arm around my wife and she literally looked at me and said, this is like a really good date. <laughs> Which is when you know you've been married for a long time. When watching pigs is a hot day. <laughs> oh, did you see a hot? No, she said good. The good day. So we're watching these pigs. And they are exactly what we are not supposed to be as Christians. All they do is engage in their every whim uncontrollably and then fall asleep. <laughs> That's all they do. There's this little trough for food and the two of them come in and just <laughs> eating, 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 knocking each other over, pushing each other out, knocking the food over, falling in the food, uncontrollable engagement and just feeding. It's good for the pigs. It's good. And after they do that, just ripping up everything they see, just every, every little, and then they just. <laughs> and because this text was in my mind, I thought, I really like these little pigs. They're going to be delicious, but this is not what the Christian life is supposed to look like. Just engaging in the fullness of whatever we want to do with no self-control, feeding ourselves with more stuff, more things, more power, more privilege, more prestige, more followers, and then just being spiritually asleep. We're called to live in a different way, as different as the day is from the night. We're called to live in a way which is self-controlled and awake, submitted to Christ who is our Lord, following him by grace and the power of the Holy Spirit faithfully and actively. That's the call of the text. Now, what do we do? We ask ourselves a couple questions. Number one. Number one. Where do the things of darkness tempt you? That's a, that's a good thing to think about today. Is anybody here tempted by dark things ever? Any two-handed tempted people? Three-handed tempted people? Good thing to do in light of a sermon like this is think about where, where am I being tempted by the things of darkness even though I'm a child of the light? Where, where am I being tempted? And then pray that God would strengthen you to stand firm in the face of that temptation. Think of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overcome you except for that which is common to man. We all deal with the same stuff. But God is faithful, who will not let you be tempted beyond that which you are able to bear, but with the temptation will provide the way out also. God has put parameters on temptation, and he's given us a way out, which is the power and the person of the Holy Spirit inside of us. But man, when you're struggling with that, it starts with prayer. Starts by acknowledging, Lord, this is a dark thing that I'm tempted by that I'm giving into. Help me today, Jesus. 
to not be conformed to the image of the world, but renewed by the transforming of my mind. Help me to follow you as a walker in the light today, Jesus. Help me. You might need prayer today with these things. Man, we all do. Prayer team will be up here after the message. Second question we might ask ourselves is, where are you currently walking in darkness? It might not be that it's a temptation. It might just be you're, you're just there. It might be unforgiveness. It might be jealousy. It might be bitterness. It might be drunkenness. It might be sexual immorality. Where are you walking in darkness? The, the glorious gift of Scripture and God to you today is repentance. Repentance. Peter stood before the nation of Israel and said, repent therefore. The times of refreshing may come from being in the presence of God. Remember 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If there's an area in your life in which you're walking in darkness, just know your identity. You're a daughter of the day. You're a son. You're a saint in light. And know your new nature. And know your new address, delivered from the domain of darkness, the power of sin broken over you through Christ and the cross. And so repent today. Repent and turn to Jesus. Endeavor to live differently by grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. A happy question. Where are you obeying and enjoying being in the light? That's good to talk about. Can I get a witness about those times where the Holy Spirit has been convicting us of something and we're resisting and resisting and resisting and the difficulty of that, but when we finally give in and obey, what a joy that is. No witnesses? Can I get a witness? What a joy that is to finally surrender to his lordship, to finally go his way on a certain matter or a certain thing. Man, that rebellion is so burdensome. But John said in 1 John, the commandments of the Lord are not burdensome. There's a freedom that comes when we finally obey Jesus. And if you're obeying Jesus today in a certain way and you're enjoying being in the light, tell somebody. Rejoice about it. That's a good thing. Boast about it a little bit. Man, I used to be stuck in this, but Christ has delivered me and I'm enjoying the freedom of obedience in this area. Man, that's worthy of talking about in the church. And then we must talk about in the church this. Where can we shine the light? There's dark and there's light. There's night and there's day. There's truth and there's error. And we, as representatives of Jesus Christ, ministers of reconciliation, his ambassadors, are called to shine the light. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Peter said in his first epistle, chapter 2, that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Church, we have the wonderful privilege of demonstrating the glory of Jesus Christ and proclaiming his excellencies in the world because there really is darkness that will be judged and there really is light that is salvation in Jesus Christ. We take this message to the world. When you walk out these doors, you are in your mission field. Tell somebody about Jesus this week. Amen? Thank you, Lord for the help of your word and the challenge of your word and the truth of your word today. And Holy Spirit, we, we need you now to lead us in paths of righteousness for the glory of Jesus. So speak to us about our lives. Speak to us about our stuff and our little dark areas and the ways in which we're walking and the paths in which we're walking. And, and Holy Spirit, I just pray that you'd really Draw us to the feet of Jesus in this time of worship now and prayer and reflection. You'd help us, Holy Spirit, know that we're loved and you'd help us know that we're called to live life differently and you'd lead us in that. Some of us need prayer today. Thank you for the prayer team that's up here. Thank you for your anointing upon them. Help us to pray today. Lead us, Holy Spirit, to the Lord's Supper. 
that we would come and remember the finished work of the cross and rejoice in it. Thank you, Lord. And Holy Spirit, that you would lead us into the very glorious and wonderful presence of Christ, some of us on our faces and on our knees here on the carpets. But lead us into a deep place of God's love, of enjoying and obeying him. In Jesus' name, amen.